Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, the webinar for our ILSR Institute for Local Self Reliance's recent report, uh, Reverse Power Flow, How Solar Plus Batteries Shift Electric Good Power from Utilities to Consumers. Um, today, it's going to be a presentation from the report author, John Farrell, who is the Energy Democracy Initiative Director here at ILSR. And um, he'll go through some slides here, and then we'll have a chance for questions. So you can make sure you ask some questions in the control panel here. We also have chat. If you run into any technical issues, um, I'll be helping you troubleshoot those. Um, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to John Farrell, who will be presenting the report. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, yeah, I'm going to just jump right in here and get through kind of an overview of what the findings of the report are. Um, I think I'll be talking for about 30 minutes, uh, maybe a little bit longer, but should have plenty of time for questions before we reach the end of the hour. Um, I'd like to remind you, you'll get a recording of this webinar that you can share with other folks, or if uh, for some reason you have to hop off before the end. Uh, but then I also just want to say thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, we're very excited about the findings in this report and to share them with you. So uh, I'm going to start off, I like to start off with some poll questions uh, just to see how people are doing today and want to start off with this one, which is how many tabs do you have open? Uh, you can go find the poll section of the GoToWebinar control panel where you can answer this. Uh, this is also just a good test because I have a couple other polls that have a little more meaning during the rest of the webinar. So it's nice to know uh, just to make sure that you have a chance uh, to find out where uh, the polling part is so that you can participate. <clears throat> uh, so we're just checking here, seeing what people have. Uh, we'll wait a couple of seconds uh, to see how the responses come in. Thanks again for participating in the first and, and silliest poll of this webinar. Uh, we'll have some other ones that are a little bit more content related here in a second. So. Um, I see that nobody else is, uh, or at least that nobody seems to be drinking a beverage uh, that I recall from my childhood 30 years ago. So that's good enough. But we do have a few people only uh, watching this webinar. Uh, thank you for your dedicated attention. And the rest of folks are more like me having many browser tabs open, even when they're presenting webinars. So uh, I think we'll go ahead and uh, leave that poll here because I have a second one um, at this point uh, that I'd like to ask. It's a little more serious because it's uh, how I want to start talking about some of these issues around solar and energy storage. It's about net metering. And so this poll is just asking, when was net metering first used? Uh, in what year was net metering first used to uh, roll back a meter uh, with a on-site power delivery uh, uh, attached to a facility? Uh, so we've got a few options here ranging from 1968 through 1993. Uh, and I look forward to your responses. Uh, something that, frankly, I didn't know a whole lot about myself until a little bit more recently, but there's a good story here uh, that kind of gets us in and gives us a flavor for um, how this decision-making process on the grid happens and, uh, and the importance of distributed energy. So I'm just gonna wait a couple more seconds to let folks respond if they want to. For those of you who are lost in many different tabs on your browser and unable to find this one, it's okay. We'll have a few other polls where you're able to weigh in. Um, Great. So uh, thanks so much, Nick. We can go ahead and close that poll. Uh, about 34% of folks got the right answer. It was 1979. Um, and it is actually a really interesting story behind it. Uh, in 1979, Stephen Strong, the developer in the upper right corner of the slide, uh, built uh, or, or helped install the solar panels on the Carlisle House, which is a, a house uh, meant to demonstrate the sustainability uh, of residential design uh, in Massachusetts. And what was fascinating about this wasn't just the incorporation of a lot of sustainability elements into the house, including solar panels, but was the fact that they decided to hook them up to uh, those solar panels uh, to the electricity grid without telling the utility company. And that's actually how net metering was discovered in 1979, because when they hooked up that uh, uh, those solar panels uh, to the uh, electric grid, it turned the uh, meter backwards. And that's how we learned about how net metering could work, was essentially the hardware at the time uh, the electric meters at the time could help us, uh, could tell us what the net effect was of having a solar array installed. Uh, they could they could roll backward when power was being produced in excess to consumption, and they could go forward when folks were normally consuming in excess of their energy production. And that's what made net metering make sense. And, and it was the policy that then stood for decades uh, as really the only meaningful way that utilities could compensate folks for um, their energy production. And I think the highlight for this for me is, and, and the lesson from this report is, utilities are about as prepared for what's happening with distributed solar energy storage as they were for net metering, which is to say not very. Uh, and unfortunately, that means that there's a lot of change and, and, and a lot of uh, transition uh, work to go through. 
Uh, so with that behind us in terms of the history and, and kind of a little anecdote about uh, utilities and their ability to prepare for change, uh, I want to start off by, in terms of sharing the refinings of this report, by simply saying that storage is here, uh, that we have plenty of evidence that energy storage is on the scene now, uh, both at the utility scale and the distributed scale, uh, and that it's going to be starting to make a meaningful difference in the way that we plan for and develop energy systems on the electricity grid. So. Um, you can see that in residential energy storage, uh, we have a sharp uptick now in the amount of residential energy storage uh, being installed uh, just in the last year. Um, it, uh, there was something we share in the report as well, Sunrun, the largest residential solar developer in California reports that one in five of its customers in the past year have been opting to install energy storage along with their solar array. Um, so customers are already making decisions uh, for themselves about whether or not solar makes sense. And we're going to increasingly see that happening uh, across the country, as we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, we also have uh, some uh, it compiled uh, in the report a look, a broader look. So not just in terms of what what is being installed specifically uh, from that energy storage report, but looking at what does it mean, what are the opportunities writ large for residential energy storage and solar combined uh, to be competitive. So what we did is a kind of uh, a broad brush index where we looked at the levelized cost of solar and energy storage, and there's a lot more detail in the report for the folks who want to dig into how we arrived at these figures. Um, but we calculated it for St. Louis, Missouri, kind of a middle of the country location, and then indexed uh, the price uh, for that solar and energy storage system for a home uh, to the solar resource in each state um, based on its uh, uh, relative power compared to St. Louis. And what we found is that in over 10 states already, customers uh, could have a solar and energy system uh, that would be competitive with residential electricity prices. Now we used a proxy for uh, utility prices that's based on their average revenue per customer. It's not taking into account things like uh, uh, tariff design, uh, or fixed charges or rate design uh, or time of use prices, all of which are going to be incredibly important in determining for an individual customer whether or not it makes economic sense. But it is a good proxy for whether or not solar and storage writ large are economical for customers. And we find that they're more economical than many people have believed. Certainly in places where we already know, like the Southwest, where solar, uh, uh, the solar resource is so strong, but also in the Northeast where power prices are high. And that's what we saw as well with just uh, solar itself. Uh, that those were the places it took off, took off earliest because it made the most economic sense for folks. Uh, that's true for commercial uh, energy customers too. This terrific report from Clean Energy Group uh, back in 2017 looked specifically at energy storage for commercial customers to avoid demand charges. That's the uh, part of the bill that is based on the period of highest use in a given month. Uh, and, and this map models where there are customers of utilities where that demand charge exceeds $15 per kilowatt, which is how demand charges are measured, and, and looks at the opportunity for battery storage to reduce those charges. And we find that there are hundreds of thousands of customers all across the country, sometimes in places we expect like California or, or Utah in this more southwesterly portion of the country, uh, but some in unexpected places like Eastern Wisconsin or Eastern Michigan or almost all of West Virginia where commercial customers could use a battery storage system today economically to reduce their demand charge. And so I think that's a pretty important lesson that this applies more than just to residential customers, but distributed solar writ large is going to have a significant impact. And of course, you know, this is our requisite chart showing that the cost of batteries are falling very quickly. Uh, this one's taken from the Lazard Investment Bank, uh, their levelized cost of storage analysis. Uh, we looked at the past three years and just uh, mocked up uh, the enormous reduction. And what I think is also interesting is the enormous reduction in range uh, of the levelized cost of storage that we're starting to see a lot as the year systems are coming to market, as we're getting more commercial experience with them. Uh, the prices for these systems are getting more standardized, uh, which is good news. Um, and battery prices are only getting better. This is a forecast from Bloomberg New Energy Finance, uh, and I'm going to talk about it more in just a second about why we're using one that's a little bit older. But as you can see, battery prices are forecast to continue falling uh, all the way through 2030 to uh, under $100 per kilowatt hour of capacity, uh, even as the batteries continue to improve in their energy density, amount of energy you get per um, uh, per kilogram of battery capacity. Um, so the the next question here is probably an easy one, but we'll go ahead back to the polls here and ask, are batteries actually getting cheaper than forecast? So we've got that forecast I showed that shows some very aggressive uh, predictions about the drop in price of batteries 
um, battery packs for uh, standalone battery storage. Uh, and just want to see what people think about whether or not they are getting, in fact, cheaper than on forecast. So back to the polls, you can find it again on your GoToWebinar bar and, and put it in. We'll hold it open for about another 10 seconds or so to give folks a chance to put in their response. But if you're busy in another browser tab, because I've already bored you, that's quite all right to understand. And uh, we'll just go ahead and talk about the results that we've got so far. So looks like about 90% of folks uh, have agreed that batteries are getting cheaper than forecast. Uh, if you work in this industry, you've probably seen charts like this before. This is one though that ILSR has developed now. We used in a, our electric vehicle report last year uh, and then updated for this report, showing that in fact, their uh, co actual cost of batteries is far outstripping the forecast. So even the most aggressive forecast, as you see here uh, by Navigant, uh, taken from a Rocky Mountain Institute report on uh, grid defection from a number of years ago, um, that the actual cost of batteries is far ahead of the predictions. Now, what it could mean is that we're simply further ahead down this curve and that the, the uh, uh, degree to which uh, the battery costs are outstripping forecasts is not going to increase or that we're not going to uh, you know, get a lot cheaper than these forecasts overall, that the, the prices are still gonna settle in around $100 per kilowatt hour of capacity. Uh, but on the other hand, it might mean that in fact, costs are gonna go much lower than people expected. And, and clearly that's where we're headed right now. In 2016, costs were about 30% uh, lower than the most aggressive forecast. In 2017, about 50% lower than the most aggressive forecast. So very good news uh, for the opportunities for energy storage uh, to provide a good complement to renewable energy. And we'll talk more about that in a couple of examples at utility scale and at the small scale later. Um, and so here's a second version of this map. I, I wanted to update it for you uh, and, and in the report to help uh, folks understand that with the remarkable progress that we're making in lowering the cost of battery storage, we're also going to see a remarkable expansion in where solar and energy storage for the average utility customer becomes a cost-effective option very soon. So we modeled, uh, the first one was based on 2016 prices uh, for solar and batteries. Uh, this one is based on 22, price, 22 prices. Uh, there's more detail on how we arrived at that forecast number in the report, but you can see that the, the levelized cost fell by about three cents a kilowatt hour uh, for that com combination system. And what it meant that is we jumped from about 10 states to about 40 states in which customers now have an economic alternative to the electricity price, uh, electricity cost rather, uh, imposed upon them by the utility company. And so we're gonna have a very meaningful opportunity for customers to make decisions that are good for them financially, that are gonna have collectively a very large impact on the grid system. And that frankly is the theme of this entire report uh, and of this presentation. So first of all, just to summarize, storage is here. Uh, and it, it's coming in a big way uh, just around the corner, but it has already arrived. We're already seeing a very strong uptick in the amount of uh, customers choosing to install it and commensurate with the uh, rapidly falling costs. The second part I wanna talk about uh, from the report is how all of these individual decisions kind of reflected on that previous map, all of these customers that live in those states where solar and energy storage can offer them an economic alternative to buying power from the utility ha is, is providing a threat to the utility business not model. Not because these customers say when they sign the contract for it, I would like to threaten my utility company or I hate monopolies. I mean, a, a small number may, but most of them are simply going to be providing a threat uh, due to the technological and economic um, uh, paradigm around distributed solar and energy storage. And that there are these three elements that give them a significant advantage over the kinds of power systems utilities are used to managing. The first one is that they're more valuable. The second one is that they are faster to install. And the third one is that these decisions are made independent of any kind of centralized planning process that both utilities and utility system regulators are used to. And so it's really fundamentally changing the way that the system works and it's diversifying broadly who is making the decisions. So I'm gonna just run through each of one of these things. And we'll start off with the issue of value. So this is just a very, broad brush approximation uh, of the cost of energy to be delivered to an ultimate customer on the electricity system. And it assumes for the purposes of this illustration that that final cost is about 10 cents per kilowatt hour for that final customer, which is a little bit lower than the average residential electricity price in the United States. Um, there's just a few places actually where it would be this low. But the idea is essentially about three cents of that 10 cents 
is a cost from generation of power. About three cents is in the transmission system and about four cents is from the distribution. And as you can see, uh, the closer you're getting to where that energy is consumed, uh, the, the, the more valuable that energy is in terms of its uh, value, the, uh, the more valuable that energy is, uh, simply because it can be produced closer uh, to home. So that's the component where we talk about there being more value in distributed energy, is that because of that locational value. The second one is, of course, that it's really fast. I mean, we've been in this webinar conversation now for about 10 minutes, which means that there's probably been 10 or 15 or maybe even more, because this uh, number is a couple years old, solar installations uh, put up just in the time that we've been on this webinar. Uh, there was one installation being done every 60 seconds in 2016, and probably even a little bit faster now, uh, given the pace uh, of the market. And so uh, what that highlights is that uh, whereas utilities, when they're building power plants, take years to go through the planning and financing and permitting process and construction process for a new power plant. During all of that time, individual customers, commercial, residential customers, industrial customers are installing solar arrays, are putting power systems onto the grid that are changing the way that the grid operates and, 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 and providing the same kind of capacity and energy that that utility is taking a long time to plan. So we've got locational value, we've got speed, and then we're gonna to get to this final question here, or, the, uh, or this final issue uh, about decision-making, and it comes to our next poll question. Uh, so this one, for those of you uh, who are onto the net metering question up, up at the beginning, it's another net metered related question, but this one is California specific, uh, and is looking at how many net metered solar arrays are connected to the grid in California. Uh, we just took this from uh, the California Solar Statistics website. For those of you that really like to be right, you can go Google that in a separate tab while we're taking the poll here, but just wondering how many uh, uh, solar arrays do you think are currently connected under net metering uh, to the grid in California? We'll give folks just a few more seconds to go ahead and weigh in. Um, anywhere from 25,000, uh, I see that folks are shying away from that possibility up to 1.2 million um, solar arrays uh, in, in, in this poll question. And we'll get to the answer here in just a second. All right, um, we'll go ahead and close it now. Uh, thanks so much for those who participated. And it looks like the plurality of you were correct. Uh, it's about 830,000, a little more than 800,000. Um, this map here highlights the zip codes uh, just for the past two years where many of those solar arrays have been installed. You can see it's all over uh, the state of California. Um, uh, you see on the bottom here from California Solar Statistics the, w the timing of when those solar arrays have been installed. But I think the key piece here is that those 800,000 plus solar arrays represent customer planned power plants. In other words, power plants that were uh, uh, where the decision making was entirely in the hands of the electricity customer, not in the utility regulatory system, not by one of the major investor owned utilities or co-op utilities or municipal utilities that serve customers in the traditional distribution monopoly uh, that is still the the rule of the land, uh, both in California and 29 other states. Uh, and in fact, distribution monopolies, uh, uh, distribution of electricity is still generally a monopoly in all states, even when customers have choice over where their power supply comes from. So I think this is really, again, the key lesson in this study is that um, the decision-making power is reversing in the same way that these 800,000 plus solar arrays are reversing the actual flow of electrons on the grid by pushing power back onto the grid system at times when that production exceeds the on-site consumption of that customer, they're also reversing the decision-making process that in, in this case now, almost 7,000 megawatts of capacity, which is equivalent to the capacity of seven uh, large nuclear units, uh, although, of course, the amount of energy produced on an annual basis is different, um, have been planned effectively outside of the regulatory process that we traditionally use for power plants over the past decade in California. And of course, there are many other states uh, where things are happening at a similar scale. Uh, and, and it's fundamentally changing the way uh, that the utility system is going to be planned and has some big implications that we'll talk about. In fact, we'll talk about them right now. And speaking of nuclear plants, I'd like to start by talking about Diablo Canyon. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Diablo Canyon, uh, it's a nuclear power plant um, on the west coast of California, right on the ocean, operated by um, Pacific Gas and Electric. Its licenses from the federal government were expected to expire in uh, just the next seven years. And initially, 
PG&E was saying that it wanted to extend the license of these facilities to keep them operating even longer. Uh, and what happened last year was that there was a big settlement agreement between the utility company and the labor unions representing the power plant workers and the communities nearby to close the plants and to completely replace the power generated from these units, which was a substantial portion, about 9% of all of the electricity generated by PG&E with renewable energy, demand response, energy efficiency, uh, and other distributed energy solutions. Um, now, the California uh, Public Utilities Commission, unfortunately, uh, argued that some of the elements in the settlement agreement were uh, not within their purview, uh, including the resource plan process uh, would have to play out in, uh, in terms of what how those power systems would be replaced. But the lesson of Diablo Canyon is one that, uh, that I think is important for a lot of folks who are working in the utility sector, which is um, these legacy power plants, these large baseload power plants, whether nuclear or coal uh, or potentially even gas, as we'll talk about later, are going to have trouble competing in an environment where energy use is declining overall as customers are implementing more efficiency measures. Um, energy sales are declining in part because customers are going to generate more of their own electricity. Uh, and the alternatives to these uh, base load power plants are increasingly more cost effective, uh, are superior on price. And so um, uh, Diablo Canyon provides a powerful example. And speaking of price, we actually updated this map from one that we had produced a couple of years ago, looking at the cost of, of wind and solar electricity across the country. And so we, we uh, mashed up some data, levelized cost data from the Berkeley Labs, uh, from uh, power purchase agreement data from level 10, uh, and looked at across the country, where what would be the price of getting to 100% renewable electricity supply from wind and solar in each of the 50 states. And this idea was built around an initial version of this that we had done for municipal utilities in light of Georgetown, Texas, uh, which is a municipal utility that now gets 100% of its electricity on an annual basis through contracts for wind and solar. So this is not a technical feasibility analysis. Uh, I'm sure many of you on this call are aware that uh, there would be variability issues uh, in terms of the timing of the supply of solar and wind, but this is just a cost analysis. And what we find, of course, is that renewables are incredibly cheap. Uh, that you have, in many cases, them being substantially under that kind of proxy cost we used in that uh, map of value earlier, where we said, oh, at a, you know, if the final cost of the customer is 10 cents, the generation cost is about 3 cents. Well, it's 3 cents or less in over half the country to get 100% from wind and solar um, from power purchase agreements. Um, and it's pretty close in most of the rest of the country. In fact, in only about 10 states, which we've highlighted here, uh, it would only be about a 10% price premium uh, over what that average uh, residential uh, utility revenue portion is for generation. Uh, so uh, very competitive. And what we've also highlighted on the map here, you'll see sort of the freckles, if you will, uh, on those different states are pow nuclear power plants uh, that Bloomberg uh, New Energy Finance has uh, deemed as having questionable economics for continued operation. And, and what you can see, of course, is that the replacement power could be very inexpensive for those units just coming from renewables alone. So um, some very sig fairly significant implications for baseload power plants uh, in our future. The second story that I want to share in terms of the implications of this inadvertent triple threat from uh, the value and the speed and the independent decision-making of distributed energy is the Puente gas plant. So uh, it's another California example, but I think as, uh, as some folks have said about Hawaii, a postcard from the future for folks that are developing gas plants. So it was a peaking gas plant meant to serve uh, those periods of peak demand uh, and uh, not to necessarily be operating around the clock. It was going to be a replacement for uh, gas power plants that were no longer in compliance with California water quality rules. And the Puente gas plant um, was about 270 megawatts. And the initial uh, bid that came in from NRG to provide this plant was evaluated by the California system operator. And they said, you know, we need you to study local alternatives. And the study came back and they said, well, local alternatives like distributed energy resources, solar and energy storage are far too expensive. We should do the gas plant. And what happened is that uh, analysts at Green Tech Media pounced on those results and said, whoa, your numbers are way out of date. Uh, as you saw earlier, the cost of storage is you know, ex uh, well, uh, well below 
uh, what was forecast is moving down very quickly. The cost of solar has decreased very significantly. And so they produced this chart as part of their analysis to highlight the difference that the California independent system op operator, Kaiso, was estimating storage costs at about $485 a kilowatt hour. And what Green Tech Media said, without getting too much into what the actual figures were, was that if we got down to about $175 a kilowatt hour of capacity for battery storage uh, with solar at $1.10 per watt, uh, then those local capacity alternatives would be competitive with the Puente gas plan. So I'm going to run through a little bit whether or not the Green Tech Media analysis shows that, in fact, those local capacity alternatives would be cost effective. So here's from Blazard again. This is looking at a comparison of solar costs. Uh, this is actually back from November 2015, so these costs are even lower now. But you can see that even at that time, uh, when this proposal was first being considered, um, utility scale solar was far cheaper, uh, a third of the cost of uh, electricity from a gas peaking plant. Um, and roof, even rooftop commercial industrial solar uh, was quite competitive. Uh, now, obviously, they serve a little bit different needs. Uh, we get into more detail in the report about this issue about uh, energy storage, uh, but we'll get there. And then the second piece was about energy storage. Uh, this was from an interesting study uh, just this, this year that uh, was looking at um, battery price forecasts and, and saying essentially the forecasts that we've had are really missing something. We need to have a better learning model for how battery costs are declining. And what they said is by 2018, by this year, we were already going to be under that cost threshold uh, of $175 per kilowatt hour for the cost of battery packs um, uh, that was mentioned in the Green Tech Media Analysis to say essentially that the local alternative is going to be cheaper. So when you combine the solar being less expensive uh, with the battery packs, um, energy has already withdrawn, at least temporarily, their application to provide this solar peaking plant uh, to the independent system operator. Uh, and it's pretty clear that local alternatives are going to be a very cost competitive option. Uh, what this means is that, uh, that Puente is not the only gas peaking power plant uh, that has to be concerned. So in Arizona, there was recently a moratorium uh, implemented on uh, larger uh, gas peaking facilities. California, obviously, with the Puente plant, um, uh, is having a lot of doubts about them. And, and what's interesting and what we put together in this map was to show that this is a problem that's more widespread than just California and Arizona. Uh, California and Arizona, of course, have these uh, regulatory actions that have gone against gas peaking plants. There are almost three, uh, sorry, about three and a half or four gigawatts of gas peakers planned for those two states alone, according to the Energy Information Administration. But there are four states nearby, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, and Texas, that have a similar solar resource and that would have similar, therefore, competitive opportunity for alternatives to gas peakers. And there are six gigawatts of gas peakers planned for Texas. So it's a really, I think, a shot across the bow for uh, the development of gas peaking power plants that if solar and energy storage can be competitive in California, at a distributed scale uh, to the um, Puente gas power plant, that that issue for gas peakers is actually much more widespread. And in fact, in almost all the states that have significant plans to develop gas peaking capacity, um, solar and energy storage is going to be a competitive threat. And we actually got a little bit more into that in the report, and we do kind of a case study of what would it look like and what would the cost be and the local economic impact be if you looked at that local alternative. So we took, this is the Southern California Edison uh, Utilities annual peak day hourly profile. So on a peak energy use day, this is what the energy demand is from the system. The yellow is kind of their original curve and the green now accommodates all of the distributed solar on the system and how it's modified the load curve. I think one, one really interesting takeaway here, of course, is that all that distributed solar has effectively helped reduce the peak by over a gigawatt of capacity, uh, which is pretty remarkable. But it's also shifted that peak now a couple hours later in the day from about uh, 4 p.m. to about 6 p.m., uh, which of course is a time when solar is not as productive. And so what we modeled is let's see what we can do to meet that, that peak period um, with 270 megawatts of capacity or about 271 megawatt hours of energy. Um, and here's kind of a zoomed in version of that same purple triangle uh, with the three things that we modeled. One was demand response, uh, which we had about 11 megawatts of demand response, which mostly came from some modeling that we've done previously on residential demand response. The second piece was distributed solar. Uh, and the third piece then was battery storage. And you can see that the solar provides some of the peak response during that peaking period, uh, but mostly is going to be used to charge up the batteries prior to that peaking 
uh, peak time. Uh, and the batteries will be drawn upon to provide the peak power uh, that the gas peaker would have otherwise done. And our analysis, and oh, there's a lot more on this in the report on how we arrived at these numbers, shows that there is substantial advantages for that local capacity alternative beyond simply the cost of energy. Uh, you get 10 times as many construction jobs. You do have an upfront a construction cost that's significantly higher, but the trade-off is a levelized cost of energy that's two thirds as high, uh, or sorry, two thirds lower. Uh, than with a gas peaker, and you have enormous amounts of local dollars that stay in the economy, much more so than the kinds of local dollar flows that you see from a traditional fossil fuel power plant, because you're now distributing all of those energy savings uh, of the owners of those solar arrays and batteries that provide that peak energy um, among all, all of those different suppliers. Uh, the one caveat here I think that's really interesting is around property taxes that, you know, a gas peaking power plant like any power plant pays property taxes to the local government. So a local government might not be a big fan of distributed energy solutions, uh, if, especially if they have already been host, as is the case with Puente uh, or Becker, Minnesota recently, uh, that has hosted a power plant and is now looking down uh, at a decision to not host a power plant. They might have a big hole in their annual budget as a result of that. And so that's gonna be an important caveat in, in a shift to distributed solutions is there may be some players who stand to lose big that represent a lot of interests. And especially since a lot of renewable energy systems usually have a property tax exemption, this could be a problem. Um, the last thing though that I wanna mention is around local resiliency, which is when you have a single gas plant, your resiliency benefit is relatively limited. When you have a widespread distributed solar and energy storage solution, uh, to meet your peaking needs. You have all of these different individual homes and businesses and public places and community gathering spaces that now have some uh, meaningful resilience, both for folks who are trying not to run their air conditioning as a cost stressor uh, during times of, you know, the, during heat waves, or when there's a, there are powder outages on the grid and having a refuge uh, at a time when uh, uh, the heat um, is really troublesome for, um, for public health. And so uh, some really terrific opportunities here as we see economical distributed solar and energy storage to meet system needs in a way that also meets the needs of the local economy. So the two big take, the, the two big lessons so far are that the storage revolution is already here and that it is having and is going to combined with distributed solar have three inadvertent impacts uh, on, on the energy system as a result of these uh, systems having high value by being close to load, uh, by being developed very quickly, and by being developed outside uh, the um, traditional planning process. And what we kind of, and this is where the title from the report came from, of course, is this notion of reversing the power flow. And I have to apologize for people who don't enjoy puns, but if you work in this space and haven't enjoyed puns on the word power before, I hope you'll come around today. Um, but reversing the power flow is really about the fact that these systems not only reverse the flow of electrons uh, and the flow of dollars, but are reversing the decision-making process. As we talked about in California, where you have 800,000 individual power plant deciders uh, now, rather than a regulatory commission and a utility and a few interveners. And, and what this really represents is, you know, I say this a little bit jokingly, but a little bit seriously, that we sort of have these four horsemen of the utility business model apocalypse. You know, energy efficiency uh, has really uh, cut into the growth of electricity sales across the country. Uh, distributed solar is having a, an, another additional impact, but as well impacting for those utilities that still uh, get their rate of return, uh, shareholder owned utilities that get a rate of return for building things, now cutting into that uh, source of profitability. Um, you have information technology, uh, smart thermostats, giving customers even more control over their energy bills uh, in a very positive way. And now you have battery storage uh, that really very significantly, both from the standpoint of say, demand charges on commercial customers or time of use rates on residential customers is gonna allow them to significantly adjust how much they're gonna have to pay for energy. It's a really uh, important and significant uh, opportunity. So, when we think about the, what's happening here, that this storage revolution is here, uh, or that it, even if you're in a state where it's not here now, it's gonna be here in just a couple of years. Um, the question is, how are utilities responding to this? You know, We've got this triple threat, as I mentioned, facing them. What's going on in the utility sector and are they prepared for what's gonna happen here? Just like we talked about earlier with net metering and being prepared for what that was going to mean. 
Uh, and unfortunately, in a, uh, this article from the Post and Courier uh, is a landmark uh, investigative journalism piece on the failure of a couple of very high profile nuclear plants in the Southeast is uh, probably more the theme than an exception to the theme of how utilities are thinking about this transformation process. Um, just as an illustration, uh, from the Energy Information Administration, there are about 40 gigawatts of planned retirements of nuclear, gas, and coal units over the next four years, and about 60 gigawatts of planned gas power plant capacity additions. So we're at a time of relatively stagnant electricity sales. Um, utilities are trying to learn how to manage their peak, and yet we're talking about 50% more capacity additions from gas alone in the next four years, ignoring all of the stuff that's likely to happen at the distribution level as customers make their own choices uh, in order to address these retirements of uh, traditional baseload power plants. And so the danger is, and this phrase, bonfire risky spending, came from that article, Power Failure, uh, as the way that they tried to describe the way that utilities had shifted the risk of these investments in traditional baseload power plants onto customers and away from shareholders. And we're at risk of that happening again. Um, and it is definitely a time when uh, utility system regulators and utility managers need to be thinking very carefully about who's going to be left holding the bag if we continue to invest in these kinds of legacy power plants at a time when more and more customers than ever are going to be able to make their own economic choices about their energy supply. And there's just you know a great illustration of this. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the kind of bids that were get, given to Excel Colorado in response to a solicitation for solar, uh, wind power, and energy storage. And they were getting bids for projects that would come uh, online in about five years at about $40 a megawatt hour for systems that include renewable energy and energy storage. Now, this is at the utility scale, but it's, I think, illustrative given that last slide that it, that is lower than the lowest estimate of gas combined cycle, which is kind of the workhorse of the base load system for utilities among gas plants uh, for these renewable energy systems. And so I think this is a really crucial uh, turning point in the utility industry to ask that question. You know, for a long time, we have perpetuated the myth that renewable energy required backup, uh, even though utility systems have been built with these reserve margins to deal with outages that all of these, that we have lots of power plants available with surplus capacity at many times of the day uh, in order to deal with the you know unplanned outages of a nuclear plant or a coal plant or if both those things happen at the same time. Uh, and now we're at a point where we really need to be clear that building more gas is not a bridge to a renewable energy future, but is in fact in place of it uh, if we are gonna continue to build in that same way. So I'm going to come back to this map. This is a, a riff on that earlier one that looked at the planned gas capacity, uh, gas peaking capacity of utility companies across the 50 states. And this instead looks at uh, what has been recently built. So in the last five years, utilities that have built gas peaking power plants, and what we find is that a similar story, that utilities not only are planning peaking power plants, uh, gas peaking power plants in states, that have a very strong solar resource and hence a very likely competitive uh, disadvantage to solar and energy storage, but that they have recently been building these gas peakers in those places. And there's a very open question about whether or not those power plants will be able to operate successfully to the end of their financial and economic life, 30 or 40 years, given that solar and energy storage are gonna cut into their revenue and the amount of hours of operation during peak periods. Uh, and that illustration I gave before is really important about the Puente gas plant. If you can build a distributed system that can meet the same needs at a lower cost, somebody's going to do it. And it might end up being a bunch of customers individually responding to time of use pricing, but they're going to undercut the revenue for that gas peaking power plant. And the question is, is it going to be utility shareholders of PG&E or Southern California Edison that pay for that mistake, or is it going to be the ratepayers of those utility companies uh, in the 30 or so states where that's the way the decision-making process happens. Uh, in other states, you can see where we've got more merchant power plant development, there are a lot fewer power plants being planned um, from gas peaking. And so um, I think that's an important lesson, but something to definitely keep in mind. So writ large, utilities, unfortunately, 
uh, don't seem to be uh, paying close enough attention to the competitive threat that's coming from the bottom up here with distributed storage and, and, and solar. Um, the things they have been doing are not necessarily very productive. And, and I title this uh, that they are responding inconsistently because some utilities are doing some of these things and very few are doing all of these things. But just to give you a sense of kind of the three main categories or buckets in which utilities are responding uh, to the rise of distributed energy. And one of them is just trying to stop it. Um, we were keeping for a while, uh, and, and based on this excellent quarterly report, the 50 states of solar, uh, a catalog of where distributed generation was under fire. And this was utilities imposing new demand charges, special fees on solar developer or solar owners, um, trying to cut net metering entirely, as was the case in Nevada, or reduce significantly reduce compensation for customers who produced energy from their own solar arrays. So lots of activities uh, like this across the country. Uh, as you can see here on this map, when we were reporting in 2016, in a single quarter, over 30 states were seeing action around distributed generation policies, much of it in the wrong direction initiated by utility companies. So there's unfortunately been a lot of effort expended trying to stop distributed generation from being successful. And the unfortunate part for utilities is number one, it's hurting their brand by doing that and, and hurting their reputation. And number two is that with batteries, customers are gonna have even more power to avoid the ways that utilities try to stop this. If nothing else, for example, if net metering compensation is reduced, I can still use more power on site if I have a battery and, and effectively do more net metering simply by storing that energy when I'm at home uh, and then using it later from the battery system. So um, stopping things is one way that utilities have tried to respond. A second one is by building utility scale renewable energy systems. So uh, to the degree to which this uh, shift toward renewables is driven by environmentalism, this could be a successful strategy for utilities. And you see some like Mid-American uh, uh, or Excel Energy, investor-owned utility companies that have made big investments in uh, solar and wind power or are promising further large investments in solar and wind power over the next five to 10 years. Uh, and they're being very successful at helping to illustrate their contribution toward reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, or, or reducing fossil fuel use or other pollutants from fossil fuel consumption. The challenge is to the degree to which these um, investments in utility scale energy actually change the economics of distributed solar and energy storage. Because if I, as a customer, I'm not seeing cost savings from the shift to clean energy, and especially if I'm not motivated by issues around climate, um, uh, then I may not have, this might not be enough for me. It might be insufficient. I may still want to put a solar array on my own roof to install a battery storage system because it means I'll be 100% renewable or much closer to it and I'll save money on my bill. And I think we're, that's the danger in relying on utility scale investments. Um, yes, they're cheaper at the point where we produce energy, but as I illustrated before, the value that distributed generation has is providing that energy close to load where we know that it's worth more. And so there is a limitation to what utility scale investments can do. Um, so I don't mean to degrade utilities that have made those investments. I think they're great, but I think it would be wrong to overestimate the degree, degree to which they are going to substantially change the way that customers view their choices about distributed generation investments. The third way that utilities are uh, uh, inconsistently acting around distributed generation is to get into the game themselves. So you have here a chart that was taken from a blog post we did a couple of years ago, um, looking at two utilities in Arizona that are providing utility-owned distributed solar under pilots approved by state regulators. And the key here is that um, num there, are two, there are kind of two takeaways from this. Number one is that customers who agree to uh, participate in these utility-owned systems are giving up an awful lot of financial benefit. That uh, you know, a net metered solar array for a Tucson Electric Power cust com customer might provide $15,000 of net benefit over 25 years compared to about $7,000 for letting the utility own that same solar array. So for the customers that have access to capital and to financing, they're not gonna wanna take advantage of that utility own system. The second thing that I think is important though uh, out of this and the second lesson of this is for utility regulators and for folks that set the market rules, um, it's really important to make sure that 
um, third parties and entrepreneurs and other folks have access to the same market that the utility does. So if the utility is going to come in and own distributed solar, in, in what ways are we ensuring that the market is a level playing field so that third parties like Sunrun or Solar City, to name a few nationals, or like All Energy Solar or Cooperative Energy Futures, a couple of local installers here in Minnesota, uh, have access to provide the same benefit to customers? Because it's quite all right if utilities want to get into this space. In fact, we should applaud it. They're recognizing this is what their customers want. But we should also make sure the customers have a fair access to all of the different choices available to them and to the degree possible access to capital to make sure that they can capture as much of the economic benefit whether or not they're a rich person or not. So I just want to wrap up with talking about some of the rules that we need. I've covered most of these in the report. Um, I want to start by doing that by just highlighting this terrific graphic from Clean Energy Group uh, which really highlights why we need the rules. Here are all these value streams that we have for utilities, for grid operators, for consumers, from distributed solar and energy storage. And the goal is to capture all of them. I'm not gonna read all of these things on the slide. You're probably familiar with a lot of these already. Uh, the idea is we have all these different value streams and we should reward the person who owns that system, who produces that energy, who provides that service to the grid with that value, with access to that value. That's the crucial uh, role that we play in setting the rules of the system. And I'll just give a few examples uh, from across the four different segments that we looked at. Uh, for state regulators, issue a moratorium on new, net, on new gas power plants. Uh, the lesson here from California uh, or from Arizona or even from Minnesota where a gas power plant was recently turned down is um, we can't put that much risk on electricity customers uh, in a state where we have a, a, a monopoly over power generation at that level uh, from natural gas. We don't, we don't know what the fuel cost is going to be long term, and we certainly don't know in the next five years whether or not it is even going to be economical to run those power plants through their economic life. We need to take a pause and to better assess whether or not it makes financial sense to put uh, electric customers on the hook for these facilities. Um, in regional markets, we need to throw lower thresholds for distributed energy resource aggregation so that even if individual customers are not going to try to access the market, that there are aggregators that can come in and pool together all those solar arrays and batteries and let them be a replacement for that Puente gas power plant um, and, and to provide that power at a lower cost and a higher local economic value. For state legislators to continue to implement the good, good rules for interconnection and for net metering and for compensation for distributed solar, uh, the Inter Interstate Renewable Energy Council releases an annual freeing the grid report that gives a letter grade to each state and every state should be looking to be a letter A. And finally, local officials actually have a, a number of things that they can do, whether it's procuring energy storage uh, for public buildings as a way to demonstrate the feasibility and to provide resiliency in the event of natural disaster. You've seen that a lot in the Northeast uh, in the wake of Hurricane Sandy. Uh, but also by simplifying permitting for distributed energy resources. Uh, a great proposal in New York City for a virtual power plant with solar and battery storage uh, to uh, defer the need for a substation upgrade uh, was derailed because the city has um, a very aggressive and restrictive permitting rules for battery storage on buildings in the city. And so trying to find the best practices there that adequately balance the need for public safety with these systems uh, with the opportunity to provide that local economic value to the grid system. So I'm gonna leave it there. I wanna go through and check and see uh, what questions folks have left uh, as we've had the conversation um, and to see if I can answer some of them now. Uh, and I will also um, uh, wanna let pe remind people the recording of this webinar will be available. Um, we'll try, to, we will, um, catalog the answers to some of the questions and send them out in a summary email. Uh, but I thank you again for taking the time to attend and I will start to address your questions now. So we've got a first question here, looks like about a demand charge um, for a solar array and that um, the city there is charging this uh, only on folks who uh, install solar arrays. Um, uh, to the person who asked that question, I really wish that I had a good answer for you. Um, you know, utilities have a lot of justification for why they put charges on solar energy systems. Um, I think this is where uh, energy storage, in my mind, provides this really powerful uh, answer in, in a lot of ca cases. 
Uh, now, I don't know if the charge that you have uh, that mentioned in your question is one that relative to how much you export to the grid system, um, but certainly it, it's going to be a useful tool in uh, keeping more of that power consumption on site. The other thing is simply helping uh, utilities, whether they're municipal or cooperative or investor-owned, uh, understand what the purpose of their charges are. So that that notion that um, uh, those charges on solar customers tend to come out of this notion that uh, by costing revenue to the utility company, you owe them something. And I think the way to fight back at that is to illustrate that there are many, many ways customers can reduce their energy purchases, whether it's through an energy efficient refrigerator or installing LED light bulbs or using a smart thermostat. There's nothing special about solar. And so I would say to that utility company, you're being unfair, that charge should apply to everybody who does anything with energy efficiency. And once there are now tens of thousands of customers who are all being smacked with this charge, it will seem a lot less attractive. Um, and so to the degree to which you can make that fight bigger uh, about the many, many different things, I think is very helpful. Um, let's see here, another question here. Uh, like, you like the you question the likelihood of people in northern states cutting the cord to the grid. Um, you're absolutely right, uh, and I, this question about grid defection is a really uh, key one. I, I, I deliberately avoided in this presentation talking about this notion of cutting the cord. Um, you know, there is this I think powerful corollary uh, that people like to talk about between mobile phones and distributed energy. This notion that we now have this distributed technology that allows people to cut the landline cord. And I think we miss a couple of things in that. Number one is that the network, the electricity network is still super valuable to people um, and will continue to be valuable because it's still gonna be a very inexpensive source of resiliency and backup power for people who have a, a you know, renewable energy system on their rooftop uh, that depending on the season might not produce enough for them to use either on a seasonal basis or a weekly basis or on a daily basis. Um, so I agree, I don't think we're going to see a lot of cord cutting necessarily in the next decade. I think what we talk about is kind of broad economic defection where we're talking about people taking 50, 60, 70% of their energy consumption and replacing it uh, with on-site energy production rather than buying it from the utility. And that will have a similar impact to actual cord cutting in terms of its revenue impact on the utility company and a similar, uh, a similar uh, kind of policy implications. So uh, I think both, I think that's a really um, good, uh, I, I think that's a really good point about uh, cord cutting. I don't think we're going to see a lot of that um, uh, in the next decade. Um, good question here about research to support the potential offset of property taxes for hosting power plants with sales tax receipts from uh, local buying power. Um, I, I think that's a great question. Um, we haven't really had to face down this that much. And to be perfectly honest, the uh, environment in which we have the debate often, often isn't really open to innovative solutions like that. Unfortunately, for example, Minnesota uh, in 2017, during the legislative session, a community was losing a coal power plant. The utility had promised to close. Um, they were afraid of losing the jobs. The utility was kind of debating, going through the regulatory process to ask for a new gas power plant, or, or sorry, they had proposed a gas power plant replacement and regulators had kind of uh, said, you know, we're gonna just press pause, we're gonna think about it. And so the legislator from that community went to the state legislature and said, hey, we want to guarantee that we get a power plant replacement for the one that we have now to save local jobs. And they were successful at pushing that through uh, a Republican legislature and a Democratic governor because the governor was sympathetic with organized labor and the Republican legislature uh, wasn't a big fan of the Utility Regulatory Commission. And so, uh, the politics of this do matter. I think I think it's actually really important for distributed energy advocates to be thinking about the solutions for communities uh, that are going to be transitioning away from hosting power plants. Uh, so that notion of a sales tax uh, replacement for property taxes is a good one, uh, but some sort of transition funds I think are going to be uh, important. Let's see here. Um, some good questions about. Uh, Smart batteries, I have to confess, I'm not as familiar with smarter battery technology. Um, I, I think um, the issue right now is gonna be uh, really in the commercial sector around demand charges is where I think we're gonna see the biggest amount of battery deployment in a way that uh, will need to be controllable. Uh, I think we'll see individual residential customers doing it only to the degree to which they care a lot about resiliency and backup power. 
um, in the next few years at least. But um, those will be the primary and beginning motivations. Um, best way to get involved in state solar public utility regulation? Oh, great question. Um, probably to find uh, another organization that already intervenes that you can be a part of. Um, the time is, that's involved in intervening in a utility commission generally requires you to be either uh, independently wealthy or able to not work because somebody else in your family has a good paying job uh, or to be paid for working in this sector to intervene. So lots of groups like Sierra Club uh, or the State uh, Environment America chapters uh, or Citizens Utility Boards are already involved in intervening on behalf of customers around distributed generation. I highly uh, recommend that you look for groups like that that are already intervening. Um, if I'm a utility executive, what would I do? You know, I think one of the things that I would look at doing is mimicking what Green Mountain Power in Vermont is doing. Um, we've written about them a fair amount. Um, they are a, the only utility company in the entire country that is also registered as a benefit corporation, which allows them to consider issues other than maximizing shareholder return uh, it, legally in terms of their legal obligation. Uh, they've invested in helping customers finance solar arrays and battery storage. They have recently proposed not replacing an aging transmission line and instead helping customers become uh, kind of off the grid independent and helping them finance that as uh, as one of their proposals. So a very interesting company. And interestingly enough, as we've just reported on in the past couple of months, they're actually more profitable uh, in, in, over the past four years than an index of other investor-owned utilities. So they're uh, social responsibility metrics have actually, uh, well, I'll say this, they certainly haven't detracted from their profitability. Um, really good question here about equitable solutions, how to make sure that low-income households and communities aren't left out. Um, I'm very interested in seeing adoption of inclusive energy financing. Uh, it's a policy that's been modeled in a number of southeastern electric co-ops, but it allows for access to on-site energy efficiency improvements in renewable energy without having uh, to be credit scored, um, without having to have your own source of financing. It uses a utility tariff model. I think it's interestingly also a way that if I'm a util utility execu executive that I can help address this issue by saying essentially the utility is going to step in and provide the mechanism by which people can make these changes. And maybe we're going to earn a little interest doing that. So uh, there's, I think, a great opportunity there. Um, with that, I've reached the end of the hour and I apologize. I had hoped to have more time for questions. I am going to save all of these questions. I will address them in an email that we'll send out to all webinar respondents, uh, hopefully with some links as well uh, that will give people a chance to follow on and get more information in some context. But thank you all for participating today. Uh, it was a joy to share the results of this report uh, and uh, look forward to chatting with all of you uh, in the future. Thanks again.